In this episode of Fictional Hangover, we talk about library violations, not breathing blue fire, horror callbacks, and creepy Victoriana in our discussion of Last One to Die by Cynthia Murphy. Everybody, welcome to Fictional Hangover, a podcast about young adult and new adult books, series, authors, and voice actors that is full of spoilers. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. And today we're going to discuss Last One to Die by Cynthia Murphy. Standard disclaimer. If you haven't read this book, please remember that Fictional Hangover is all about spoilers. If you haven't read or listened and don't want to be spoiled, stop listening to us and go read or listen to the book. Then come back. If you haven't done this, but want to pretend that you have, or if you don't care about spoilers, or if you just like the show so much that you don't care about any of that, then listen up. Yay! Yay! Oh. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay! Anywho. What? What is going on? I think it's going to be a bit of a wacky one today. I I'm quite excited to talk about it is. this one. Yes! Samesies. Samesies. I'm also excited for this one. Can I point out I'm wearing a fictional hangover t-shirt? I think that's Ooh. lovely. I'm wearing a t-shirt with an alligator on. Again, it's absolutely perfect. However, you can purchase ours from Redbubble. Oh. oh. Cheap plug. Cheap plug. Cheap plug. Fictional hangover. No, no ER. ER. At redbubble.com. <laughs> For all your favorite fictional hangover themed merchandise. It's almost like I say that at the end of every episode. It is. But you know what? Well you know what? It's probably good that we mention it sometimes throughout the episodes because I bet a lot of people stop listening at the end of the episode. I mean, it's the same thing every single time. So why do you need to listen to it again? You don't. You turn hey, it off. As a, as a podcast listener myself, I listen to the very end. It's like being in the cinema and staying to the end of the credits. This is why they start putting scenes at the end of the credits so people can actually acknowledge everybody's participation and you know in in the creation of it. So they need to stay to the very, very end. You never know, one day we might change it up at the end and there might be some kind of mysterious thing added, like a competition, for example, or watch out for this special thing that's happening. You never know. Always stay to the end. I do sometimes throw in weird shit that we've said in the episodes at the end. I haven't done it in a while, though, but but yeah. No, because we're starting to keep it in the main episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone listen to the very end this time, because surely something's going to be added, right? Right? Who can say? I'm sitting far too away from my computer today to be able to do that. I need to like, literally pick it up and bring you forward. I know. I'll just I'm, the book instead. I'm also Ooh. sitting far away <laughs> I am also sitting Anything. very far away today, but that's so you can see the entirety of my face. Because if I sit close enough, the way I have things cobbled together right now, it's like my nose and my mouth. And no one wants to watch that for <laughs> oh, two no. hours. Oh, I'm, I'm sad I haven't oh. had sleeping yet. Oh. Anywho, book, anyway, we have a book, we have a book, it's a book podcast. Yes, it's a book Not podcast. Random- I do have background info and it's from one of Amy McCaw's YouTube interviews and nice. you know everyone knows how much we love Amy McCaw she is part of the fi- fictional hangover family she is We've adopted her. she is you can find and Kevin McCaw as well yes yes you can find Amy everywhere on social media at ya under my skin she's everywhere with that name Go and say hi and tell her we sent you over. Yes, please do. So, because I watched the video on YouTube, I'm going to have to paraphrase part of it here. (laughs) But it was so much fun. So Amy asked Cynthia if she was more afraid of supernatural horror or real life horror. And she said it's changed now that she's grown up. But then <laughs> she mentioned how it would be easier to prepare for a real life horror because you know where all your weapons are and you know which windows to break. <laughs> but then she said, but with a ghost, you're just screwed. So, yeah, so I enjoyed that. 
Oh, that's an excellent point. Yeah, they also Ooh. went on to talk about the Fear Street movies, which I really enjoyed, and I was, like, chiming in with with things. Like, oh, I watched that! Oh, that was my favorite part! Yeah, they, they didn't <laughs> hear me. They weren't they weren't there. They, they did spiritually. They did spiritually. I'm sure. I'm sure they did. You're an excellent trilogy. You're so smartly done. You watched them finally. Yes. I'm so happy that you watched them. I watched them as they came out, and I really, really, really wanted to talk about them on the podcast, and you're like, what? I don't even know what you're talking about. I haven't watched these yet. I haven't. Well, to be fair, I mean, my time is um, spread thin at the moment, you know, looming deadlines and all of that. So I have to pick and choose what I can and can't watch and when I'm allowed a break. (laughs) I'm having a rare break right now. (laughs) I just really feel like you should make Fictional Hangover your priority. Um, What's wrong with you? (laughs) (laughs) Damn me needing my education. If I don't get this, I can't keep my job. Damn you! No. Mm -mm. Because you've got this job right here and you make approximately $12 a month on it. Because we split split our Patreon profits. (laughs) Except for we don't, because we don't make enough money to, you know, actually, like, use it for anything. Except we buy people gifts. We buy yeah. author gifts with that Patreon money. Yeah. <laughs> we bought a couple of uh, Gish scholarships, sponsorships, sponsorships with yeah. that money. We do good things for others, not for ourselves. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, you know, help us help others by becoming a member of our Patreon. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you've got any ideas of how to make Patreon better, something that, you know, you would actually want to give us money for, tell me, because I can fix how, that. What, what would you like us to do to help you invest in the podcast? Yes, what would make your life better? Because that's clearly <laughs> all we're going for here is is other people, and that's good, because we're good human beings. Anyway. And while you're at it, go what? to Redbubble. Yes. And buy a t shirt. <laughs> yes. I feel like we I feel like we've started making more money from Redbubble than we do from Patreon. Yeah, but then you've also got to consider how many people buying from Redbubble are us. Buying we most. don't make money uh, when we wait, no. I think I I think we make money when you buy stuff, but not when I buy stuff. Yeah. And I almost just said I haven't bought anything in a long time, but that's a lie because I've bought two things in the past week. I can't believe you're going to lie to me and the listeners betrayed. I'm a liar. Everyone knows it. It's fine. Anywho, book. Book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Book. Uh, this this episode is going to be a lot of fun because Cynthia Murphy is joining us in a little bit. Yay. So uh, be sure to check out the bonus episode that will contain the entirety of the interview with her. It'll be a lot of fun. I'm very excited. But I'm very, very excited. We have to talk about her book first. So we, we know what we're talking about with her, and everyone else knows too. Yes. So, can it I? Is helpful. Can I just ask why are all these wonderful horror books coming from where you are? Um, like, possibly because you know, British horror is brilliant and potentially far superior than any other horror. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, maybe that is. Maybe that is what it is. You know. I just think at the moment the British public the publishing industry is um strongly encouraging um YA horror. So it's kind of like it's hit that. It's like, you know, when it was all of a sudden vampire fiction and all of a sudden the big gown dresses when we did the selection we talked about that when it was released. Yes. So I just think in the current British publishing market there's a strong push and a strong desire for the murder mysteries and the horrors and the slightly spooky because there's been so little of it. Yes, um, and it makes me so happy because that's my favourite. YA horror is my absolute favourite thing to read. And now everything, at least coming from where you are, is YA horror. So we're just going to have to keep having all of our favourites on all the time. Yeah. The, my TBR for YA horror is quite extensive because there's a lot coming out. There's a lot just come out. Um so yeah, it, and they all centre around the city. It's like this the same little like central people, like you know Amy McCaw and Kat Ellis and Don Kirkuch and Cynthia Murphy, you know, and they're all kind of like 
in their own little club. They and are, that's and very I, helpful. You know, yeah, I think that's really where it's all coming from because, I mean, I've loved Dawn Kurtigic since her her first book came out. I've been obsessed. Yeah. And now, like, that we have the podcast and we just keep inviting her on all the time. And then, like, she's sharing her friends with us. That's how we met Kat Ellis. And then mm-hmm. from Kat, we met Amy. And now from Amy, we're meeting... Cynthia and it's just we're just making so many friends and we just keep inviting them on the podcast it's fantastic it's really great so what I'm saying really is that I need to come and visit oh also yeah. I want to also mention uh, Amy McCall's husband Kevin because we love him too yes yes he's been adopted into the family quite soundly yeah he has um, what I would absolutely love and this is my you know on my please make this happen wish list I want an anthology with all of our favourite authors contributing to it, and there's so many of them. You can imagine, you know, if they give, given a central theme, what what they could pull off would be absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, that would be great. Can we put that together? Can yeah, we let's make a just book? do it. Let's make a book. Let's do it. Let's do it. Can I give you a fun fact about Last One to Die? You can. This is the first book I bought after lockdown. Wow. First, The first time when I went into a bookstore after lockdown so it'd been over a year possibly wow and it was the first book i bought there was two books i was after and this was this was the one they they actually had in stock that's excellent i don't know that i've bought a book from a bookstore in person i don't even know i don't even know when the last time i bought a book from an actual bookstore is it's not often. I mean, I I still I I did pre-orders back in January, so every now and again I get a dispatch notice and go, "Oh, I don't know what this is, but it's going to be fun when it arrives." Is it for me? Is it for the husband? Is it for the child? It could be for anybody, but it's just delightful getting book mail and going, "Oh, oh this one's for me!" Excellent. <laughs> Highly recommend doing that. Speaking of book mail, I got some lovely stuff from Cat Ellis a few days ago. For Ooh. Burden Falls. It's lovely. She's really nice. And she Excellent. even waited. She even waited a little bit for me to move into my apartment before she sent it. Because she's, oh, she's that She's good. the sweetest. Yeah. She is the sweetest. Yeah. Anyway, let's start this book. Let's talk about this book. Neve is checking into her room that she'll be living in for the next six weeks as she takes an acting and drama class in London. It's very different here than it is in Ireland, obviously. She's struggling with getting her room as the desk clerk, Derek, doesn't have any Neves registered. She spells her name then. N-I-A-M-H. Funny spelling, ain't it? And then things get moving again. But then a beautiful young woman struggles down the stairs with a huge trunk begging to change rooms. Her room on the 10th floor is too high for her terrible fear of heights. Though all the rooms are booked, Neve offers to swap her second floor space as long as it's okay with Derek. He doesn't change any information in the register, but allows the swap, so the girls head up. On the way, Neve drops a folder full of her class paperwork. Sarah, the elegant girl, helps her collect them, and they learn that they'll both be starting drama courses in the morning, and they plan to go together. Later, after getting settled in her new room, Neve looks through her paperwork, getting ready to fill in all the forms, when she realizes she has Sarah's too. She takes them down to her would-be room, knocks, but gets no response. A passerby says he doesn't think anyone's in there, but she tries the door just in case. Neve enters and discovers Sarah dead on the bed. <gasps> Yikes! Yikes! <laughs> Derek gives Neve some tea and sugar to help with the shock, and also what stands in local parentis when the PC starts asking her routine questions. It's possible that Neve is a suspect, but Derek won't have her interrogated at just 16. She uses her busted cell phone to call her mom, who wants her to come home immediately. But she wants to stay, as that's what her gran, a former actress, would want her to do. 
everyone switches to rooms in a different hall to make way for the investigation and then Neve heads to class. The first lesson is embarrassing and full of icebreakers. I hate Mm -mm. those. Nobody likes those. Stop doing icebreakers. Stop it. And then lunch rolls round. A girl, Jasmine, invited Neve to sit with her, but instead of it being a friendly conversation, Jasmine immediately starts in on Neve seeing a dead body and barraging her with questions. She heads off to the bathroom for a cry, spilling soda on everyone at the table as she goes. When she comes out, another girl, Tasha, is waiting on her and or cleaning the soda (laughs) off her top. Tasha is friends with Jasmine and thinks she was way too pushy about the murder investigation. That's comforting, at least. Mm. Neve lends Tasha a cardigan and the two new friends go to their next class, where they'll learn they'll be getting work assignments soon. They watch videos of former students talking about their assignments. Maybe they'll get to act as an animal in a zoo. Hopefully not. (laughs) Mm. Mm. After classes are over, Neve drops her phone off for repairs and goes to the library, where she meets Ruth, the librarian, the star of the show. I love Ruth so much. (laughs) While she's there, she also sees a creepy assistant guy named Will. Ruth is delightful, as I was just singing about her, if you couldn't tell, and she tells Neve about a scholarship she should apply for, so maybe she can take more courses here after this one. Neve looks into it and finds she'll need to write an essay for her application, so she'll definitely be back in the library to work on it, and Ruth offers to help her, because she's a good librarian. (laughs) She leaves then to retrieve her newly repaired cell phone and head back to her room for the evening. The next day, Neve is excited to get to class and to see her work assignment, a Victorian street museum, cool, and her new friend Tasha, but Tasha isn't there and her name is missing from the work assignments list it's blacked out and so is sarah's well that can't be good we know why sarah's name is missing does that mean something terrible happened to tasha too yes yes it does (laughs) Jasmine comes by and says that anyone who makes friends with Neve gets hurt. Tasha was attacked and is in a coma. And she might never wake up. Oh. Yikes! Yikes! (laughs) Yeah. Neve skips out on the rest of the day, understandably. Uh, Not interested in being bullied by Jasmine or stared at by the other students for being friends with the victims. She goes to her work assignment early instead, but upon arrival, Jeffrey, the guy in charge, calls her Tasha. Ooh. Saying that he was told Neve wouldn't be coming. Uh, Ooh. Simple mistake? Possibly. Ooh. She's led on a tour of the Underground Museum, meets Tommy, another museum volunteer slash actor who is, like, really cute, mm-hmm. <laughs> and gets a Victorian dress to wear as her costume, which makes her look eerily like the girl she's pretending to be. So much so that she sees a portrait of the girl, Jane, and she thinks she's looking into a mirror. Whoa. She's given some notes and things to study, and will be all set to return later in the week and get started. It's not creepy at all. No, it's totally fine, and everything's normal. Me doesn't want to go back to her new hall just yet. Still weirded out about, you know, finding Sarah dead. So she talks to her sister Megan on the phone for a bit and then goes to the Globe Theatre to watch some Shakespeare. She spots Tommy in the crowd and the two spend the rest of the evening together. He says she must be having a tough time. Really? Duh. And she says... (laughs) Yes, then launches into finding Sarah's body, but he was talking about Tasha instead and didn't know about Sarah at all. So, uh, yeah, she's having a tough time, especially in the making friends department. Near midnight, they decide to part ways. Tommy kissing Neve's hand in farewell. (gasps) Swoon. Delightful. She takes the long escalator down to the tube, but then the power goes out, and she can hear someone coming for her. 
Thinking of every kung fu movie she's ever watched ever, <laughs> she kicks out at her assailant. Then the power comes back on. Neve finds a girl with long, dark hair and blood streaming down her face. Oh. They both scream. Yeah. As you do. That's a perfectly reasonable reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Neve is in the library now, pondering buying a bought ticket back home. Ruth comes by to check on her and offers to listen if she ever needs a chance. Because she's a good librarian! <laughs> she decides she's not going to book a ticket just yet and goes to a lecture about puppetry and how Penny Dreadfuls had an impact on the theatre. Puppets! <laughs> Here is where she learns about characters in those works, like Frankenstein's Monster and Jekyll and Hyde and the Devil and spring Jack. spring Jack was different from everyone else at the time. White suit, devil beard, blue frames out of his mouth and metal claws. Um, yeah, no. No. I love him! Don't want to meet him. Love the concept. Don't want to meet him. I love him so much. <laughs> And people still claim to see him around to this day. Yikes. I love this it. makes Neve think about the girl she saw the night before with the bloody face. Turns out she had to have emergency surgery where they removed her eye. Oh. Yikes. All the yikes oh. to the power of ten. Oh, oh my god. Oh, yeah. That's bad crack. That is Ew. bad crack. Imagine finding out that someone you possibly could have kicked down the escalator because we don't exactly know what's happening in that scene, you know, because the power's out. It just, you kicked her down the stairs and now she doesn't have an eyeball. Eye jelly. You pop, you pop somebody's eyeball, maybe. Yeah. No. Do not like it. I love it. You know how I feel about <laughs> eyeballs. And teeth. You, you love an eyeball. I know. Teeth and eyeballs. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> in the library later, Neve looks for Ruth for help in finding newspapers, but runs into Creepy Will instead, who tells her Ruth is out. Neve immediately runs into another person, Jess, Ruth's daughter. She helps Neve with the newspaper, and then they talk about the attacks and also how creepy Will is. Then, Jess notices that all the attack victims, which are more than just Sarah, Tasha, and the tube girl, look just like Neve. Ooh. Neve has noticed it too. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, the next day, Neve is back in the museum, but not ready to play her part as Jane. Instead, she learns about the museum, sees a creepy fortune-telling hand that gives her the creeps, and then follows Jeffrey around and learns the stories told on the tour. She also sees Tommy in the crowd, looking cute as always. Neve learns that Jane had a paramour and snuck out to meet him in a warehouse, and her hair got caught in some machinery. And she was mangled to death. Ooh. Fucking yikes! I love that I keep getting these gruesome murder scenes because they're my favorite. <laughs> mangled! Mangled yeah. to death! It's sad how common that was, though, to be fair. Jess visits Neve and they look through the museum with Jeffrey. Jess loves the history and looking at the cool, creepy Victorian things they have on display, especially the morning items. There are some things that are marked as on loan, but Jeffrey tells the girls that those pieces, hair bracelets, um, Jereja types, mourners' tears, and fortune telling items they can bring loved ones back to life were actually stolen. Neve is getting creeped out by all this stuff and wants to leave, so they do. She and Jess go for chips, and then Jess shows Neve some research she did while Neve waited in line for their snacks. She found some details about what was stolen from the museum and then shows a Pinterest-style board of similar things which are super creepy. Then they talk about how all the girls that have been attacked recently look like Neve. Or Jess says, and it might be worse, that maybe the attacker thinks that they were her? Yeah, that's going to keep you up at night. Yikes! The girls go to the library. <laughs> 
to ask Ruth <laughs> if it's okay if Neve stays the night because Neve is sufficiently creeped out about literally everything happening around her and doesn't want to be by herself. While Jess is talking to her mom, Neve looks through a book that was left out on a table. It's open to a spread about creepy fucking puppets, which I love. <laughs> Neve sees Punch from Punch and Judy with his creepy little grin and the devil and then remembers her lecture about spring-heeled Jack with his metal claws replacing Punch for a while. Then Will tells her creepily in her ear that she needs to watch out. She startles and he drops all the books he was carrying which are shockingly about spring-heeled Jack, penny dreadfuls, and morning rituals. She also notices that he has claw marks on his hands. Then he disappears. Creepily. <laughs> Jess comes back in and is surprised to hear that Neve ran into Will because he's not scheduled to be working. They talk about the wounds on his hands and then decide to violate all rules of librarianship and check to see what books he has checked out to maybe tell the police about don't do that violations do you need a moment <sighs> violations is all i'm saying don't do that they discover that Will has only checked out Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie stuff, so he must have just looked at the books without checking them out. They check the titles, though, to see who has checked them Violations! out. Violations! <laughs> and see that Jasmine had one of them, and that they are all from special collections, which typically only Ruth lets people access. This time, it was Will, though. Jess and Neve obviously go to investigate. <laughs> The special collections room is temperature controlled, has movable shelves, and zero cell signal. It also locks from the outside. The girls go in, but then Jess has to go help someone in the main part of the library, so Neve is left alone. And then creepy shit starts happening. <laughs> As she's pretty far in the stacks, the lights go out. That happened earlier on the escalator, too, remember? She pulls out her phone to use the flashlight, but it's pretty dim. She's looking at the titles, and then she sees a shadow at the end of the aisle. Is it Jess? Ruth? No. The shadow disappears, but then the shelves start moving. Ooh. Oh, God. She's going to be crushed. She starts running, but trips over oversized books as the shelves close in. Neve hears banging at the door. It's Jess, who says the key is inside with her. She Ooh. keeps running, but falls. And then she's stuck. Something in her leg pops as she pulls free and tries to fling herself out from the closing shelves. Her head is out and right by the wheel that moves the shelves. Then she feels a feather-like caress of metal scrape down her cheek. But luckily Ruth and Jess burst in the room then. Neve sees a blurry shadow run away. Ooh. Hey, that was one of my favorite parts. <laughs> <laughs> I used to volunteer in a library that had the creepiest stacks as well. And those metal shelves. Mm, Not what? fun. Then the lights used used to go out as well because they were um, motion censored. Oh, yeah. I worked in a library that had movable shelves. And it was my greatest fear that I was going to get stuck in them. I quite enjoyed it. I was looking at these weird ritualistic wood carvings in this really like 17th century book. And I was using my phone light so I could see them properly because it was in a dark corner. And then all the lights went off. I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. Anyway. Now, 
Neve is being interviewed by Detective Moran. He's pressing her for details of the attack because, well, it's the kind of thing now. And she's the only one who has any details of what happened to her. <laughs> there was one other girl who was attacked before Neve arrived for her course that was able to speak about her attack, but she was very scattered and didn't give many details. She was attacked by an assumed man with metal fingers. No. Nope. And slashed. Mm -mm. Yikes. No? Don't like? Yikes. It's because it's not eyeballs or teeth. <laughs> and she was slashed no, are pretty across good the too, collar ball. <laughs> it's very good for cosplay. Uh, <laughs> she was slashed across the collarbone and chest. Maybe Neve thinks to herself she's not the only intended victim after all. Detective Moran seems to be trying to frighten more details from Neve, saying that all the other girls were gravely injured. But why wasn't she? Why did the attacker gently stroke her face? Mary had injuries to her face and neck. Sarah was killed with injuries to her face and neck. Chunks of her hair pulled out. Tasha's in a coma with injuries to her face, neck and hands. The escalator girl? Face and eye. Why not Neve? Before she can freak out too much, that ship sailed, Derek comes in and shuts down the investigation. Turns out, Derek is a retired officer and a great man to be in charge of her dorm and acting as her guardian. Yay, Derek. I love Derek. I love Derek <laughs> almost as much as I love Ruth. It's a lot. <laughs> if, if, if Ruth's career was different, she wasn't a librarian. I might not love her as much if she wasn't a librarian, because hello! <laughs> Back in her room later, turns out she didn't get to spend the night with Jess after all, Neve is chatting with her sister on the phone. Neve asks Megan if she'll pretend to be their mom on the phone if anyone calls about the investigation or, you know, about what's been happening during her course. She knows that their mom will make her come home, and she doesn't want to. Not yet. Not when she could maybe potentially get a scholarship and keep taking courses and maybe start dating Tommy. <sighs> Megan agrees, as any good sister would. She says their parents aren't home much now anyway because their gran is in the hospital and not doing so well. So it should be easy to pretend to be their mom if anyone calls. They disconnect after that and Neve falls asleep thinking about Tommy. She wakes up a few hours later, tummy rumbling and bladder full of pee. She decides she'll get some noodles and play on her phone for a bit before going back to sleep. She takes a noodles for one selfie, then looks through some of her other photos she's taken since she's been in London. That's not what she sees, however. She sees photos of herself asleep from just a few minutes ago. Oh, yikes. Yikes! Neve freaks out, <laughs> understandably. Is the person still here under the bed? In the bathroom? She nopes out of there and runs for the elevator, but the lights start to flicker and she hears a metallic scraping sound behind her. No, thank you, sir. Uh -uh. Put that away. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. She runs down the eight flights of stairs instead and to Derek's desk. She gasps out that someone took pictures of her while she was sleeping, but oh no, she didn't bring her phone with her. They go back upstairs, taking the elevator this time, and go into her room. No one in the bathroom, no one under the bed. And worst of all, no sleeping pictures on her phone. But they were right there! The next day, Neve tells Jess all about what happened, and Jess tells her that they need to talk about it later because she has to go help at the library because Will didn't show up for his shift. After classes, Neve overhears Jasmine, who is definitely wearing the cardigan Neve lent to Tasha, saying that Tasha is out of her coma. She also says a bunch of shitty stuff about how St. Mary's Hospital is a dump and she goes to a private hospital and that she's going to a party the next night at a haunted theater and that she should be able to tell if it's haunted because she's spiritual. <sighs> she's the worst. 
And Ugh. you know what else? She denies that she's wearing Neve's cardigan. She's the worst human being ever. I hate her guts out. Neve and Jess meet up and tell Ruth they're going to the movies, but they're really going to the hospital instead. They're able to get in to see Tasha, who doesn't really remember Neve well. Jess stares outside Tasha's cubicle since she doesn't know her, but then when she doesn't seem to remember Neve, she goes in. They ask what she can remember, and it's not good. Tasha says she was attacked because she was wearing Neve's sweater. She kept seeing Will all day, everywhere she went, and then, well, she was attacked. Her fingernails are missing. Nope. Mm -mm. They talk about the other attacks and how they all seem to be connected to Neve. But no, she can't be the reason behind the attacks because the first one happened before she even got there. Well, whatever the link is, they need to tell Detective Moran. Neve and Jess leave, intending to head to the police station, but they get turned around in an older wing of the hospital where they find a children's wing named for Jane Alsup. That's the Jane Neve dresses as at her museum job. But the timing isn't right. This wing looks to be from the early 1900s, but Jane died in the 1830s. None of this makes any sense. They finally make their way out of the historical wing of the hospital and leave, but Neve feels haunted by ghosts. At the library later, Jess tells Neve that Will is missing. He didn't show up for work and no one has seen him. Weird. They make plans for Neve to eat and stay the night at Jess's and meet up again after Neve's shift at the museum. There aren't a lot of people there. Even Jeffrey goes home, leaving Neve alone with Tommy. But wait, who is that shadow of a girl with long, dark hair? Jasmine? Um, Jim? Mm. No sense worrying about that now because Tommy has invited her to have hot chocolate. And then they make out a little. Not a bad day at work. Not bad at all. (laughs) Afterward, they go to the party that Jasmine was planning. And after some sneering by Jasmine and a promise by Tommy to make everything okay, he pulls out an ancient Ouija board in the haunted theater. Nice. Mm. Mm. Yes, do it. Jasmine wants to contact Sarah, which makes Neve nervous. But a wink from Tommy lets her know that he's going to control the board. Except he doesn't. Oh. And they don't hear from Sarah. And instead... They hear from Jane, who spells <gasps> Neve's name over and over and over and over and over again. She gets upset that Jasmine is clearly messing with her. But then everyone looks at the planchette again with no one touching it and sees that it's spelling run over and over again. No, no, thank you. Uh uh-uh. uh. No. Run. Put that in the bucket. Yeah. I don't believe Jasmine would know how to spell Neve's name correctly. I agree with you, because Jasmine seems like an idiot. Yeah. The next day, Neve tells Jess all about what happened. She didn't end up spending the night because there was a leak at the library and then Neve got out... (laughs) Uh, And then Neve got Ouija freaked. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. Sorry that Ouija freaked made you... uh... Ah, that's that's delightful. The next day, Neve tells Jess all about what happened. She didn't end up spending the night because there was a leak at the library and then Neve got Ouija freaked. (laughs) They end up talking about how dreamy Tommy is, but he probably has a girlfriend, so, you know, bummer. Hmm. Then Jess shows Neve the microfilm machines and an article about how Jane had a box in the theatre named for her. Neve thinks it's weird that there's so many links to Jane, but Jess just says it's going to help her write the stellar scholarship essay so she can stay and continue studying drama. They go to the theatre on a ghost tour, but sneak off and up to the boxes to check them out. It's too high up for Jess, so she stays on the other side of the curtain, and while Neve is looking around, she sees someone dressed all in grey. A ghost? Probably. A ghost! Not an employee of the theatre at all. <laughs> no. It's a ghost. 
Back in her room later, Neve talks to her sister, who says that their gran is in the hospital again. She thinks about going home, but decides her gran wouldn't want her to, so she goes to make hot chocolate instead. While she's in the kitchen at three in the morning, she glances out the window and sees Will looking in. Ah, no, no. Nope. She oh. calls Detective Moran, who tells her to go back to her room and lock and barricade the door. She does, but then the doorknob starts to turn, and a voice oh. calls out to her. She freaks, telling the Cretan to go away, but then Detective Moran calls and tells her they've arrested Will. She sees him being carted away. He's wearing gray. Just like the ghost Neve saw in the theater. Ooh. Not a ghost! A <laughs> Neve feels better the next day at the museum. She has plans to go to dinner with Jess and her parents, and after a long day working with Tommy again, he offers to take her on a quick date before walking her to dinner. Mm. On the way... She babbles about her classes and the scholarship and her sister and her gran, but not about Will and how he was arrested outside her room last night. They go on to an outdoor market and Tommy reveals he learned the language of flowers from his mother who died when he was younger. They kiss a bunch and he buys her flowers and they walk on. He wants to show her another place, but it's getting close to dinner time and she gets creeped out by him as they walk through a dark part of the city. Maybe toward a cemetery... <laughs> But eventually, they get near the restaurant and everything's fine again. Tommy asks when he'll see Neve again, and she says that tomorrow is her last day at the museum, so that might be it unless she wins the scholarship. He says he doesn't want to lose her again, just as Jess runs up. She's startled by Tommy's handsomeness and later says she thinks she recognises him from somewhere, but then they go to get dinner. Later that night, Neve walks into the cemetery, right up to the mausoleum, as if her feet know the way, and she's just following. She sees her face shrivel up in the window reflection, and thinks, Neve, run, like the Ouija board told her to. She wakes up with a scream. Ooh. <laughs> or, you know, maybe that was her phone ringing? I mean, she was probably screaming too. If I saw Both. my own face shriveling up, I would probably scream. I scream every time my alarm goes off in the morning, so... Oh, yeah. So, see, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. So, her phone. It's Jess. She was supposed to meet her 15 minutes ago. When Neve answers, instead of Jess, it's Ruth. Jess is in the hospital. <gasps> Neve rushes there, but maybe sees Jane in the stairwell and finds her feet carrying her to Jane's wing again, where she sees Tommy in a photograph from the 1840s. Ooh, ooh, ooh. She snaps several pictures, then remembers she's supposed to be visiting Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth says... Jess was attacked late the night before, just after Will was released from his 24-hour holding. And he wasn't caught or arrested again. Neve leaves Jess and Ruth for her last shift at the museum, but Jeffrey's not feeling well and Tommy's not in, so he closes up early. Neve sees that she's gotten a ton of texts from Jess while she was in there, though, and they say that she's okay. But then there are several that get progressively weirder. Is he there? Is Will there? It wasn't him, Neve. You need to trust Will. Don't talk to anyone but Will, okay? Uh... What? Will's there now. And they awkwardly leave together. Mm. Ooh. They go to the library, where Jess says she has something to show Neve. Will didn't say anything on their way there because he didn't think Neve would believe him. But Jess says he was never the one doing the attacking. Then she shows Neve microfilm articles showing someone who looks exactly like Tommy, but from the 1830s. 
then Will gets a book, the same one he caught Neve looking at way back in the first encounter, and it's filled with a timeline of attacks. They've decided that Tommy is a revenant, a reanimated corpse. And she was kissing him. Yeah. And, <laughs> and also Spring Heel Jack, that attacks girls that all look like Neve. Yikes. Yeah. And speaking of girls that look like Neve... She gets a phone call from Megan, who has arrived on a surprise visit. Yay! Oh no. She went to the museum, where she was met by Tommy, who said he was taking her to a party at Jane's house, and they'd meet Neve there. Neve convinces her sister to run away, but then she's caught and knocked out by Tommy. Oh damn. Yikes. All of the yikes. All of the yikes, yikes. all over the place. A graveyard of yikes. Oh. The murder of yikes. Oh, oh, indeed. <laughs> they realize that Jane's house is her mausoleum, which Ooh, is nice. the same one from Neve's shrivel face dream. It seems like the ghost of Jane has been trying to help Neve all this time. Jess gets freaked out, not wanting to see Tommy again since he just brutally attacked her. So she stays at the cemetery gate, trying to get in touch with the detective, while Neve and Will go to the mausoleum. Neve looks through the shrivel face window and sees Tommy inside, lovingly cradling a skeleton. Oh. Megan is nowhere to be seen. Tommy opens the door, and Neve rushes in, finding Megan barely alive. Will sneaks her out, while Neve talks to Tommy about what he's been doing. It's not good. <laughs> Nothing about Tommy is good. Yikes. Tommy was Jane's paramour all those years ago. They were going to run away together the night that Jane was mangled by the machinery. She had hidden money and things to sell for her elopement behind the machinery and accidentally turned it on trying to retrieve it and died. Yikes. Tommy's been trying to bring her back since then, using magic that his mother, a witch, taught him. He has surrounded Jane's body with Victorian mourning items like tiny vials and wreaths made from hair. He has to follow a specific ritual to revive Jane that requires jewellery, hair, fingernails, an eye, and one more item. He got the jewellery from the first victim, Mary, hair from Sarah, fingernails from Tasha, and an eye from the girl on the escalator. The only thing left? The warm, beating heart from someone he cares about. Neve. And he attacks. Fuck it. Not good, man. Not good. Mm -mm. No. No. Warm beating heart? Uh-uh. It's the warm bit that got me. Right? Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> Knowing the temperature kind of changes Ooh. things. Ooh. Gotta be fresh. Mmm, tasty. Mm. Neve wakes up in Jane's coffin. Tommy ah. hovering over her and putting on spring-heeled Jack's finger blades. He created that persona long ago to help him try to complete the attacking women ritual to bring Jane back. And then the London newspapers went crazy with it. He doesn't actually breathe fire, which is sad. <laughs> it's unfortunate. <laughs> Neve tried to think of every horror movie she's ever watched as he's explaining this, and then uses Jane's finger bones to cut her way free of the burial shroud she's tied up in finger bones no no <laughs> she manages to use the finger bone to stab tommy in the neck when he comes by to see what she's doing she flies out of the coffin shattering the tiny vials of mourners tears as tommy begins to die a lighter falls out of his pocket one jane had made for him all those years ago and that he stole from the museum along with the rest of the revival ritual things she sets the hair wreaths on fire and leaves Tommy inside. Our favorite things, Ooh. walking away from a flaming building. 
that's harking back to last week. We've got all meta. This was great. Yes. I love a callback. It always happens. There's a couple more things that like that remind me of weeks past. We can talk about that in a little bit. But it's go excellent. On. It's excellent. I love a callback. Later, Neve goes to see Jeffrey at the museum one last time. She didn't get the scholarship, so she won't be staying in London. But seriously, would you want to? No. Uh. Uh-uh. No. Anyway, it turns out Jeffrey called Derek. His husband. <laughs> so exciting. When Neve left with Will, thinking it was a little odd, Derek found them at the cemetery and arrived before De- Detective Moran, whom Jess had finally gotten in touch with. Now Neve's at the museum with her family and everyone is safe and sound. She gives Jeffrey Tommy's lighter, but doesn't tell him where she got it from. Before she goes back home with her parents and sister, she goes to the portrait of Jane thanking her for her help. She sees a golden wedding band on her finger that she swears wasn't there before. She it seems she and Tommy finally met in the afterlife. Oh, that's kind of a heartwarming ending, except for, Aww. you know, heartwarming. All the death. Heartwarming. Heart. Warm, Hot, warm, warm beating hearts, heart. Warm beating hearts. Right, shall we have a break where you can rage about Library protocols and violations. I mean, yeah, we probably should. <laughs> because all the violations. All the violations. All of them. I'm violated by the violations. I know. Oh, oh. Yes, let's take a break. Oh, while we're taking a break, listen to this promo. We keep getting more promos. We keep getting more people wanting to share their show with us. Yay! That's fun. That's fun. So listen to this one. These days, more authors are including mental health content in their books. But do you ever wonder how accurate some of this stuff is? Or do you ever read something where you know the author just gets it? I'm Elise. And I'm Priscilla. And we are Novel Feelings, a podcast where we discuss mental health issues in fiction novels. We are psychologists and book lovers, and we have a lot of opinions. So look for Novel Feelings wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to your show. We're back! We're back! So, those things that I mentioned a couple minutes ago, you know, yes. with, uh, you know, things that are throwbacks. The callbacks, all the callbacks. Yes, yes. So, um, there was the one scene where it's right before Neve looks through her phone and sees pictures of herself sleeping, which is creepy. But she wakes up and she has to pee. Yes. And I was really hoping that like in Blue is for Nightmares, she would pee her pants, but she yeah. didn't. I was thinking exactly the same thing. As soon as she was like, I really need to pee. I was like, pee pants, pee pants, pee, pee pants. Pee, oh, pee your pants, pee your pants. Yes. Um, <laughs> something else that also goes back to Blue is for Nightmares. Um, when Tommy was mentioning that he had learned the language of flowers, there was a yes. lot more to that scene. And do you remember, you know, he's, like, showing her all these different flowers and, like, tucks one behind her ear, and that one means she's pretty, and this one means something else. Yeah. And then she picks up a lily, and he's like, no, 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 that's the death flower. But that also happened in Blue's for Nightmares. I thought it was I really screamed, cool. no, that's the death flower no! at the same time. <laughs> so it was like, no, that's the death flower. Also, Enola Holmes calling back even further yes, to December last year. Yes, language because of Because that was all about the language of flowers as too. Yes. Set in Victorian England. I know. <gasps> it's so great. <laughs> and if you want to go back even further, which I don't know Always. that this was mentioned way, way, way back then. But, you know, all those Gail Carragher books that we read... They all read all the flowers and send secret messages all the time. So <laughs> let's just keep just just keep digging way, 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 way back. Oh, we're gonna go with the way back machine. We yes. Are. All the time. We are. All the time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love it. I shouldn't have laughed so much when she was like setting fire to the mausoleum, but on two counts, I absolutely loved that scene, but also the fact that she did it and didn't chicken out of it. She was like, no no, no burn baby and then i was thinking about when we did dread nation and we were talking about how exquisite it would be to have that flaming background to walking away yes like, yes i kept expecting Tommy's head to suddenly 
<laughs> pattern from the right with his eyes crossed and his tongue hanging out. He's derpy. <laughs> yes, and then lightning shoots from his eyes and his eyes yes. pop. What else did we talk about last week? It was too much, too many things. Oh, it was just there. it was just everything and all of it together was just magnificent. I was just so excited for for that. I was like, oh no, this is brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it was a beautiful scene. I really enjoyed it because, like I say, she actually did something about it. And that's the other thing I liked about Neve. Bad shit was happening and she was telling people that bad yes. shit was happening. Yes, And not just suffering in silence. Yes, I know. I love that she... Oh no, shit's happening. There's fucking terrifying pictures of myself sleeping on my own phone in my own room. Better run downstairs and tell Derek immediately. Like, yes, yes, because that's what you do. You go and tell the grown-ups who also happen to be retired police officers. Yes, but you also take the phone with you. I was screaming at Neve at that point. You knew she'd forgot it because it was yeah. explicitly not said that she took the phone with her. Yeah. And I was like, she's left the phone. She's left the phone. Check your pockets, love. You've left. See, I told you, Neve, you've left the phone. Yeah. I Honestly, I think the running commentary, me telling Neve off, was quite um, prolific in this. <laughs> but see, that's that's another thing. And also, like, with the violations, the violations in the no. library. <laughs> oh, like, don't snoop. Check out history of people and definitely don't plan to tell the police the things that you found it's violations of privacy <laughs> but anyway of course, having never heard of gdpr i mean come on people but like of course they're gonna do that because jess has the ability to and they're 16 they're yeah. kids working in the library so of course they're gonna be like holy shit i bet he's got a bunch of sh- murderous shit checked out let's go see what he's got sherlock holmes and agatha christie hmm. that seems more like it's how to solve a crime than it is to commit a crime <gasps> oh you don't say and that's what he was doing the entire time well there you go mm. do you know what though with the will character i really thought he was very well done but he wasn't in very much he was a very subtle character but when i was 16 on my first ever job there was somebody who was like will just slightly creepy slightly off edge slightly inappropriate because they had no like social interaction you know very poor social interaction with people and he will reminded me of this person so i was like oh no oh i don't like but he was a kind person he just didn't know how to talk to people yeah. so when you were friendly to him he was he kind of almost latched onto you and he was just a nice guy he just didn't know how to talk to people and that was basically will so yeah i've got a lot of sympathy and empathy for will um i did get a a little bit creeped out when he was standing outside the window. And of course, we know he was there for, you know, good reason. But when I was in college, my first year, there was a guy that I had made friends with. And he was kind of creepy in the same way. But he was standing outside my first floor window one night. Oh, no. Which no. was also a bit of a callback, again, to Blues for Nightmares, where he's standing outside the window being all Mr. Creepy McCreepson. Yeah. Yeah. That That's in- not comfortable. No, that ended up getting way, way worse. And I had to, like, go to campus police and stuff. So, Ugh. yeah, that's... You had to go to Derek. I did. I did have to go to Derek. But the, but the bad thing about that was that he went there first. And told campus police that he was having trouble with his girlfriend and she would probably call freaking out soon. And that's no! what happened. Yeah. <gasps> Scumbag. Yeah, he was a douchebag. Oh my god. Yeah. So that's fun. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Let's not talk about real creepy things. No, let's talk about Victorian museums, shall yes. we? Even How though... messed up are Victorians? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. I was going to say, even though we know from the background info in the interview with Amy McCaw that Cynthia Murphy likes real life horror better than supernatural horror, and that's what just happened. Anyway. Yes, Victorians. <laughs> let's talk about Victorian <laughs> creepiness instead of real life creepiness. Want to? Yeah, I agree. Let's talk about book appropriate creepiness. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Victorians are just messed up. I mean, they always have been. I've always known them to be messed up. But seriously, you know, I've seen like the the, the morning paraphernalia and all of that creepy things. There's two museums quite close to me. One of them I've talked about before is an open air museum and it does have some of the stages set like like some of its 1920s, but they do have um, an 1800s Victorian area as well. But there is another one as well that reminded me hugely of the one that Neve works at. Um, it's a place called Preston Park um, and it has the streets and the shops and it's all covered over as well. And it's, it has like the pharmacy and it has the sweet shop and it has the pub. It has all of those things in and it just, it has that smell that museum smell too and it has the the glass cabinets with all of the, the trinkets and paraphernalia behind and I was like I've been here I know this place this place is like a short drive away from me and freaking me out so I adored that and I've been to those type of museums before in different places as well I've been on those ghost tours I absolutely adore door that kind of thing so this was perfect setting for me absolutely ticking all of my boxes that's fantastic i just want to come and visit if i come and visit will you please take me to all of these things yes okay yes we will go and visit the museums thanks no <laughs> thanks i also liked spring Hill jack had you heard of spring hill jack no before this book no i haven't in fact i thought that he was made up and i thought well that's really fucking cool but no he's real yeah and he's way yeah. worse like he's oh, yeah. jumping over buildings and stuff i wish that tommy could do that i wish that tommy could jump over buildings and breathe blue flames from his mouth yes <laughs> Spring Heel Jack is, I know, I think he kind of gets a bit mixed up sometimes with Jack the Ripper. It's that kind of creepy uh, mythology where the London newspapers are the ones who basically built it up and yeah. made it ten times worse. I mean, Jack the Ripper was bad, yeah. um, but it was made worse through the newspapers. Um, but yeah, same with kind of Spring Heel Jack. But I've, I've read a couple of books before that are set with Spring Heel Jack. And it was so nice to have him in this book because he's, it's one like I, di well, I didn't expect like an American audience to know him because I think it is a very British creepy myth. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the like the, the cool things about this book. And, you know, as an American reading a book from the UK, like. You know, I, I didn't know that it was real. And so then I was intrigued by it. And then I went and did research. So that's really cool. Um, mm. But can I tell you something that I read um, about this book on Goodreads? Yes. I was reading reviews and someone gave it a really like low review because the entire time she thought Spring Hill Jack was Jack the Ripper. And she's like, none of these Jack the Ripper details are real. She did a terrible job being Jack the Ripper. And someone else was like, where'd you get Jack the Ripper from? Because it's definitely not the same person. So <laughs> I enjoyed that. Like, uh, yeah, it's not Jack the Ripper at all. Stop being stupid and giving people bad reviews because you're so dumb. <laughs> That's it's giving people bad reviews because of your complete misunderstanding. Right. I thought at first potentially there was um it, it may have gone down the Jack the Ripper route and I'm so glad that it didn't. Yeah. Um, Everybody's done it, Jack the Ripper. Ah. Uh -huh, exactly. Yeah. And I'm so pleased it was Spring Heel Jack. And I'm so glad that you got to experience a spring a really good Spring Heel Jack um story as well. Because they they are so few and far between. But yeah, that person good reads dumb yeah it's so it's so unfortunate and they just it's went on and on well. about it too like that none of this is jack the ripper this isn't this isn't right at all what's wrong with you it's because not it's... jack the ripper and no i i swear the words the ripper are it nowhere in this book no mm -mm. that is and i don't even think rip might be in terms of like throat ripped open or yeah chest was ripped open but yeah yeah just stop it yeah. and it's so unfair on like cynthia murphy because she's getting a negative review and people are going to read it 
because of somebody's dumbassery. Yeah, I'm just really glad that there was someone who commented afterward, like, what are you talking about? Where are you Check getting this facts. from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can actually get this book. I know we've talked about it being a UK YA horror, um, but you can get this book from uh, Book Depository. You can get it on audible.com, I believe, as well, if you mm-hmm. want the audio version. Yeah, I have it on um, Audible. And there's probably ebook versions as well that's available. So you might not be yeah. able to pick the physical one up in the bookshop, but you can get a hold of it. And I really think it's a really nice example of um, YA British horror um we, we we've got loads of examples we can everybody <laughs> loads please see episodes previous yes <laughs> and we're probably gonna have them in the future as well no doubt um but yeah i i do recommend people get picking it up because it is fairly light horror as well it's not gonna be like it's creepy it's a simmering creepiness because it's more like a ghost story than anything else than yeah. a murder mystery yeah. and that's the other thing I loved about it, the Jane element. Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. The Jane element was really cool. And that Tommy was like, you know, in both timelines. He's always been here. Not breathing blue flames. But yeah, that was really great. Um, I feel like there was something that I thought of a minute ago that I wanted to say. Oh, oh, um, you, you mentioned like, you know, it's, it's like a, like a safe horror. It's not too yeah. creepy. It's like, it's like younger horror, which, um, <laughs> it, it, it makes me laugh because in part of the, um, background research that I did and also in a couple of the reviews, again, on Goodreads, people were talking about how like cringy it was because she's like always talking about how this guy's so dreamy and she just keeps like... Oh, people are dying and being attacked all around me, but Tommy's so cute. He's so hot. But in, I think it was in the Amy McCaw video chat, like they, she was talking about how, how cringy it was on purpose because she was thinking like a 16 year old, you know, and that's what's going to happen inside the mind of a 16 year old. They're going to be like, oh, but he's so cute. I just can't help it. I might be able to get a boyfriend. Yeah. And I also I was think shouting at Neville of those sections. I will admit to being like, Neville, it's just a boy. You don't need him. I think some of that attraction <laughs> might have been, you know, because he's supernatural. Yeah. And the connection with Jane as well. Yeah. You know, if Jane was going to, if, if they're going to elope and she resembles Jane so much to the point that Jane is kind of like attuned to her, she might have been picking some of that up in some kind of spirit bond kind of no. way, you might say. Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh my goodness. No, it was a good, I mean, it was very well established that she was a 16 year old girl and you felt yeah this is definitely a 16 year old girl especially when she's like yeah i've lived on uh ramen noodles for the past three days yeah. and just sitting eating chips uh, 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 by the river thames is just yeah it was it was a lot of fun um i think one of my favorite scenes Apart from all the library stuff, because I loved all the library stuff. And, like, Ruth, amazing. She's an amazing librarian. And everyone who ever wants to be a librarian should aspire to be exactly like Ruth. Um, I really loved the sleeping photos on her phone. That oh, was yeah. so creepy. Could you imagine picking no, up your phone? No, I don't phone? want to imagine. Ah. I don't want to imagine. No, I don't want to imagine. I, but, you know, you... <sighs> I don't want to say this in any way derogatory, but there was so a certain element of predictable horror, and I don't know if it's just because we're used to reading it. It's kind of the way our brains work, where we can try and like almost chest thing ten steps ahead when it comes to books because we know we're going to analyze them so much. Yeah. Um. But you know when she went and she didn't pee herself and she went to the toilet and she made them the noodles and she starts checking her phone and she takes the picture and you're like there's going to be pictures of you asleep there's, there's going to be, be pictures s- of you asleep something you terrible's going- happening with that phone it's going to happen yeah. immediately yeah I was doing the same yeah, thing yeah yeah and I, I was just waiting be? for it to happen but that's what I kind of like as well which is the same as horror it's the psychological element to it not the gross of the, the you know the, the the viscera flying everywhere I don't need it to be violent I like the psychological nature to it and you're just waiting for it to happen it was excellent yeah, yeah, it was very good. 
It was a lot of fun. So much fun. <laughs> it was. I didn't like the, the, the date. You know, when the when Tommy and Neil went on the date to the market, which I quite like the market, but when you started... If anybody started talking to me about the language of flowers, that would red flag for me. Yeah, then... it's like... <laughs> you know, at this point, we didn't exactly know that he was from the 1830s. And so you think, man, this guy is just over the top. It's too yeah. much. Stop it. And like kissing her hand and like she trips on the sidewalk and he like swoops in to pick her up. Like, no, dude, stop it. It's too much. <laughs> too much. But he is a Victorian gentleman slash murderer. And that's what you do when you're a Victorian gentleman slash murderer. Are you going to get attacked by a feline spring heel jack? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I am. Oh, who's your favorite character? Oh, I don't know. It's a toss-up. Unfortunately, not Neve. It's very rare we do pick the central character. I know. Though, to be fair. It's like we almost try not to. Yeah, I think I do actively try and look at the other characters and try and bring them to the forefront. It was Jeffrey for me. I really loved Jeffrey, the museum. Uh, manager slash tour guide who you know he told the creepy stories he knew everything about all of the the bits and pieces in the museum and was so atmospheric and so camp it was delightful i'm like i need to know jeffrey i need jeffrey to do a tour of creepy places for me mm -hmm. it was just delightful i i adore jeffrey i think he was so much fun do you know what, what you? do you know what's really cute my favorite was Derek. Oh, that's so cute. Was so cute. <laughs> I squeed out loud when Jeffrey was like, "Yeah, I called my husband Derek." I'm like, yeah. oh, "I'm so happy." I'm like, oh, that's so cute. That's so sweet. <laughs> I also really love Ruth. I like all the adult yes. characters. Ruth had multiple dimensions as well. It was nice to actually have a character like. A disabled character fairly represented, mm -hmm. it feels like. Mm -hmm. Um so it was nice that, that not everybody was within the same box. People were outside. It was representative, which is, you know, something that we really, really love in our books as well. I yeah. really enjoyed the characters. You know, I mean I am I'm saying Neve wasn't the favourite, but I did enjoy it, especially because she was like, I'm not taking this shit. Yeah. I'm setting the fucker on fire yes and then walking away from the flaming mausoleum as it explodes and then tommy's like head an, comes spinning into the screen like an absolute badass yes yes loved it <laughs> i loved it did you have any surprises just the derek and jeffrey are married <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. so happy. it was so cute <laughs> <laughs> also probably that tommy did not actually breathe blue flames and the fact that he mentioned that, <laughs> that yeah, was, was that a surprise or was that just disappointment it was it was a slight bit of disappointment <laughs> it was it really was yeah i enjoyed that oh i love the the scene the description of when she was looking through the mausoleum and seeing him cradling the bones yes yes i could just see him like me petting the skeleton. <laughs> My sweet Jane. Oh, Jane. Jane. I oh, love you, Jane. Jane. Soon you shall be back with me, Jane. It was a little bit like, it wasn't exactly, but do you remember the mummy when Imhotep <laughs> is cradling and he's like, you will be with me again. And it's like, yeah, yeah put the bag of bones down, love. Put yeah. the bag of bones down. Yeah. Stop it. Imhotep and Anaxuna Moon. Yeah. Move over because Tommy's here. Tommy's here with you. <laughs> and he won't breathe blue fire on you, but you mm, know, yeah. he has his metal claws. I love his metal claws. Mm. I love him. I think he's great. I'm just so happy you've got that. Uh, that uh, you've experienced the Spring Hill Jack story. I'm just over the moon with it. I know. Now I just want to do more research. Yes, fall down that wormhole, honestly. It's that rabbit hole of brilliantness. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> Woo, okay um speaking of exciting is it time is it time it's is it time, time would you rather? it's time would you rather Yay! Yay, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh oh and did you hear that there is someone else laughing at our ridiculousness it's cynthia murphy Yay! and we're so excited hello Yay! 
we're so excited that you're here, but we have to contain our excitement right now. It's only Would You Rather excitement, and then it will be book excitement later, because, oh my gosh, did we love this book. So, Progressive levels of excitement. Okay, let's answer the ridiculousness first. (laughs) Okay. Ready? Go! Go. (laughs) We asked on social media, would you rather work as an actor at a zoo or at the Victorian Street Museum? On Facebook, 29% of you are working in a zoo and 71% in a museum. On Instagram, 28% in a zoo, 72% in a museum. On Twitter, 44% at the zoo and 56% in the museum. And on TikTok, 44% zoo, 56% museum. I get really spooked out when the stats are so close or exactly the same. Uh, it makes me uncomfortable. I know. They're they're really, they're they're very close to each other this time, at least, you know. Two and two. I'm surprised. Very close. I can't believe so many people picked the zoo. I I honestly thought more people would pick the zoo because animals are cute and better than humans. Oh, yeah. But if you're acting in a zoo, like, what do they expect that they'll be doing? There's no poop in the costume, you know? You just. Oh, yes. Oh, I don't like those, though. I don't like people in big heads. (laughs) No. (laughs) Would you prefer, like, body paint? As opposed to, like, a furry suit? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they both have their own levels of creep, don't they? Depends whether there's anything under the body. Ooh. Mm. Let, let's, let's have some comments and see if that'll clear opinions <laughs> yeah. before we start getting into the body paint slash furry cut discussion. Because that way is... Ooh, ooh, the, the, very, the very first one is about why they don't want to work in the zoo. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Dakota P1228 on TikTok said Victorian Street Museum because Victorian dresses are gorgeous and I wouldn't want to crawl around on all fours pretending to be an animal. Fair. Yep. Fair. Yeah, very fair. <laughs> what was if you like the back half of a giraffe or something? Okay. Colin on Facebook says, I'll have zoo <laughs> so long as I get to dress like a panda and mess with people. Or at least look after the baby pandas because they're just so cute. Depends how he means mess with people. Probably pretend Hopefully to be a real animal the and then way. jump out at them. <laughs> yeah. And try to escape. <laughs> from I the hope pauses. so. Yeah, take his head off. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Coral on Facebook said, I love animals, so I would have to go with the zoo. Just as long as I don't get eaten by a lion. I'll be good. Just don't go in your lion enclosure. Problem solved. Yeah. Don't act like a lion and you'll be fine. Or a gazelle. Don't be a gazelle. <laughs> Lions will eat you. Fact. <laughs> Steph on Facebook said, Zoo! Because animals make my heart happy. There was Aww. heavy emphasis on the ooh. Aww. Yes. I feel like I need to ruin these these people's uh opinions because the actual that comes from real life. So I was desperate to go to drama school and I did um a summer program with a girl who I it was a play scheme program, so we were like just looking after children for the summer and she had just come back from drama school and she had to spend an entire week with her class in a cage at London Zoo, pretending. And she was like, no, <laughs> I don't need to go to drama school. That's it. Done. <laughs> so that's where that comes from. So sorry to all the people who think it's like cute and lovely animals. and you know. It's actually terrible. Well, you see, this is why yeah. I like El Kev on Instagram, because he seems to be a bit more realistic with it. He says, although the museum will most likely have that weird old smell of a 100-year-old dust might poop, and rotting furniture and carpets, I'd still pick it over having to throw monkeys over having monkeys throw their poop at me all day. So he's yeah. you know if you're in a cage pretending to be a he's monkey, do you have to throw the poop as well? Yes. Depends how far you're willing to like get into your art. Method actor. We're all to It's method here. acting, yes. <laughs> Uh, books are forever on instagram said zoo because at least if you die and it happens to be in an animal enclosure then at least the animal won't starve to death that's very realistic she took it too far yeah. or well, far yeah. enough you see I mean, at least the <laughs> on instagram says victorian street museum so i can play a dress up so we do have one defender of the museums in the comments 
Yes. Oh, uh, Mar- yeah. Marrow Child on Instagram as well. Victorian Street Museum for sure. I already have the outfits. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, I know who that is. She does. She does indeed. There you go. I think there was one more. Oh, it was Brie Tart on Instagram, actor at the zoo. That means I can see more than animals. To be fair, do you have to be an actor at the zoo to go and see the animals? I was recently at Edinburgh Zoo. <laughs> I saw the animals without playing dress up. So... But what if you want just... to play dress up? Well, then be play dress up, but you don't have Imagine to. Imagine if somebody put you in a zoo for a week and said, get in that cage and pretend to be an animal. <laughs> Just no. no, no. I'm guessing no. Victorian Street Museum by that then, Cynthia. Yes, definitely. That is my definitely Victorian Street Museum. Get to play dress up. Get to poke around musty old things, which is possibly my favourite thing ever. Um, and the the pretty boys there. <laughs> the pretty boys. Oh. <laughs> Tommy, oh, oh, he's so I'm pretty. Sorry, he can Tommy. be my boyfriend. <laughs> if only he could breathe fire. And if only he was like alive. Yeah. And not a alive would killer. help. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know what? You you win some, you lose some. People can <laughs> change. You can't have it all. Exactly. You know. Exactly. What about Look, you, Amanda? He's... Where are you going to be? Hold on. Hold oh, on. Oh, we're I got to talk something. about Tommy. We're unpacking something. I got to talk about Tommy for just a second. <laughs> because even though he's a crazy, crazy fucking murderer, he was so kind and gentle stroking those bones. <laughs> caring for he his He right? He was so sweet with his, with his bone stroking. So. Um, Can you please phrase he, that in a different okay, way? No, <laughs> it was purposefully inappropriate. <laughs> Bone stroking. So anyway, Tommy's not all bad. If only he could breathe fire, he would be better. But no, I had to cut some bits. Fine. Because in the original story, like in the original Spring Heel Jack thing, he also wore a white oil skin, like tight fitted suit that would make yeah. it stand out i mean to be fair though in no, London, it would yeah some some bits had to go you know <laughs> if this was soho probably would get away with it maybe yeah he's not allowed on that side of the river though shame the south bank boy um i'm i'm obviously i'm gonna pick the uh the museum as well we, we can all hang out in the museum hey together. you say obvious but you've dressed as a bat as a ferret you've done you know the donkey horse's head what was the last thing you did yes. that was an animal uh a raccoon yes i was a raccoon recently so you see it obviously really that's true i do like dressing as an animal for cosplay more than i like wearing victorian clothes because i just don't have a lot of those but i do have body <laughs> paint and a bunch of weird ears and teeth so maybe I should pick animal at the zoo. Maybe I should pick the zoo. I'm changing my mind. I'm picking the zoo. Oh, you'll regret it. I'm sorry. I can't imagine <laughs> being one of those real life installations. Like, you know, it, oh, just yeah. It it gives me the fear. Like, the, <laughs> there's not a lot that I'm frightened of, but real life stuff like that. If somebody made me go and do it, and I mean, when you're like 18, you just go, okay. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. You you know, you wouldn't argue against it. You'd just, like, hate yourself while pretending to lick a paw, do you know? <gasps> there oh. you go, you were a cat. I did, sorry for her. Very recently as well, Amanda, <laughs> you were a cat. The video was Was I? When was I a cat? Um, Spells Trouble. You was oh, Zena. yeah, I was a cat woman. Ah, I was I was Zena, I was a cat woman. But she's more of a woman. She's still a cat that cat. turns into a person. But she is still a cat. You're right. I did lick myself and eat tuna. I have the so, video yeah, proof. It's cat. online. Check it out all of our social media. I need to get back into the cosplaying stuff. I don't have any more excuses anymore. All my boxes are unpacked. Ha. Huh. It, it's well, just been nowhere to go to do it yeah uh, it's true <laughs> but now, and now i've got some good choices you know there's the, the past couple of books that we've done i haven't really had anything that i could actually 
be. There's not been a lot of meat to the characters. No, there's not been a lot of meat there. Yeah, but see, this one I can have a missing eyeball. I can wear, (laughs) you know, the white the oil skin suit <laughs> you can be in a mausoleum stroking a bone i can stroke yep. a bone <laughs> i can what else i feel like i had something else in my head earlier that i was really thinking about being and now i can't victorian think of what it is victorian morning ah. for a p- portrait yes oh yes punch and judy oh i fucking oh hate yeah punch and judy. Also horrible I detest the yeah. devil hate them so many mm. <laughs> i just need to see what you request and then i will accept all challenges <laughs> we can worry about that later um let's move on to our next question by the way it's victorian museum just so you know oh. <laughs> I, I thought that's what you picked yeah, i thought you said it happen. earlier yeah clearly okay would you rather have someone take pictures of you while you're sleeping or wake up in a coffin with someone else's bones. Pictures. <sighs> That's so <laughs> invasive, though. Oh, it's so great. I know, but can you imagine just waking up in somebody else's coffin? Because the thing is, we're taking somebody, pictures of somebody, Doing and if it's it. pictures of you, that's really invasive. It's really intrusive. I don't like... that. You know when you see people on social media posting <laughs> pictures of like their friends and family asleep? I don't like it. It's like, no, don't yeah. do it. No, there's I no don't like commission involved in that. I mean, it's not really. I'm not a pretty in... sleeper either. No, there's drool everywhere. Ninety nine percent of the time, the makeup has not been taken off prior to bed because, realistic, not everybody does that. No, uh, no, all over that. places. I've got retainers at night. That's yes. Oh <laughs> no! <night>. Exactly. <laughs> but at least if you wake up in a coffin with somebody else's bones, yeah. you know that's like that's an interesting story for the future. How often does that happen? True. You can also stroke them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> stroke of the bone. <laughs> Where's Scully Joe? I should have brought them up. <laughs> you should have. There needs to be more bones in this conversation. He does. He's downstairs pretending to be a vampire still. Mm, yeah. Well, I'm definitely waking up in a coffin. Just, just for the unattractiveness of the sleeping also it's really creepy <laughs> it's really it's more creepy. creepy especially since you know you didn't you don't know who did it and then they're gone right after yikes yeah yeah no i do not like that do not no. like that <laughs> mm. that's what we like to hear good now <sighs> the coffin lid cannot be on that's just adding to the creep the, the the claustrophobia factor of that of that one though so i'll be in the coffin lid open mm. I don't mind the bones whatever well she was lid open so that's fair but she was in the shroud mm. yeah. yeah so you'd be like all wrapped that up that sounds cosy to me like oh, <laughs> oh this is nice all that velvet you just snuggle mm. down in five minutes that sounds really so nice, nice. <laughs> it's, it's cosy it's gonna happen it really is <laughs> next question <laughs> Would you rather go on the ghost tour or the museum tour? See, I've done both. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily the ones from the book, but I've done yeah, both. I want to do both. Ghost tour. Yeah. Just because when you're in a museum, you can like wander on your own. But with a ghost tour, they take you to places and explain the horrendous history. And I like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you would get more good stories from a ghost tour as well. You know, mm. it's going to be led by a really good storyteller. Yeah. So I think that would be more exciting mm. than a museum tour. And some of the ones that they do in the UK, they take you around pubs. Yes. So you go to a pub and have a drink and they tell you a haunted story and then you go to the next pub and they do the same. There's a so. one in Edinburgh you that you'd like, books. Amanda, and it's a literary book tour. So it's not necessarily <gasps> ghosts. But it's literature. I'm in. I mean, it might be a bit Let's too mi- a bit a bit too much classics potentially, but it's books and it's pubs and it's Edinburgh. I mean, what's not to love? Old, yeah. Can I dress up? Yeah, I've I've cool. dressed up for a ghost tour before. There. I was Daphne from Scooby Doo <laughs> because obviously. What did you dress up? Daphne from Scooby Doo. Oh, okay. I should have been Velma because of the glasses, but we'll go. It was a 
birthday party in Edinburgh and it was a graveyard tour and um, there was a banana and a box set and Batwoman and other assorted people. Okay. (laughs) Can you imagine being a bit drunk and walking past that graveyard and just seeing Daphne and a banana? (laughs) The banana for me, that's what I'm excited about. We were on the Edinburgh webcam. (laughs) Just like... There used, to be, there used to be a web camera on the Royal Mile and we were, we were seen bobbing down. All you could see was this big banana and then this orange wig. Oh, I had to ask to make sure it was okay if we went in costume because it might just, like, you know, deta- detract from the entire ghost thing. But, you know, same, people seem to appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, okay. yeah, people always like a costume. It's okay. It's okay. Anywho. <laughs> okay, next question. Yes. Would you rather get non-lethally squished between library stacks or be kicked down an escalator? Mm. Squished, I think. Yeah, Yeah, squished. You're going to get squished. Well, you could maneuver a little bit between the shelves and... The thought of falling down one of those big escalators is oh horrible. I hate heights. No, nope. I don't like heights either. But getting getting squished by the library stacks is frightening. Yeah, it's just you can just imagine them slowly closing in. But in this case, and I mean non lethal though, non-lethal. right? It's non lethal, so it's <laughs> fine. And you know there were some oversized books that could potentially keep them from closing all the way so might not be so bad <laughs> you see having you know we, we, we talked a little about about this earlier when we we're talking about the summary and we both you know i volunteered in the library in the special collection section there was the rolling stacks amanda is you know a librarian as well and so we've both been there but I'm sorry, books, but I would sacrifice the hell out of you if I was going to get squished. I would just be pulling the books down off the stacks because then no. they would close. Well, these... No. Especially not the ones in the special collections. No. The only reason... <laughs> Put your gloves on and no, you be don't gentle wear gloves. with them. Those are more dangerous. These were... The, this, this wasn't the, 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 Charles Dish, the Charles Dickens first edition. That was in the rare room. These ones were just um, minutes from meetings for coal miner associations and I'm like yeah I'll sacrifice the hell out of them and that stacks it's gone it's gone I don't I don't need to know <laughs> about who attended and who gave apologies to the meeting in 1918 sorry some history doesn't need to be noted down I would sacrifice them <laughs> So no, nobody's falling down the escalator? No, but you know why? The teeth on the escalator stairs, if you think about it, those things are jagged and they're going to rip you to shreds. And Ooh, especially yeah. like your long hair. That's going to get you cold. Just, oh, yeah. Hot, hot. Oh. And we've all and seen the concrete X-Files. We've all seen the Gene Tombs episodes. And every time I think about escalators, I think about Eugene Tombs and him getting squished in an escalator. We've all seen that. It could happen. Nope. Oh, horrible. <laughs> yeah, no, no to escalators. Escalators are dangerous. It's mad the amount of people who get in touch with me after reading that paragraph, that section, because it just must be a universal fear, you know, the lights going out and being stuck on the escalator. It's like, <gasps> do not like just everybody hates it. <laughs> all of the lights going out all over the place. I'm scared of the dark. So lights going out <laughs> immediately, no. Mm-mm. I was on a ghost Hearing the hunt metallic... and that happened. It was terrifying. Going up, walking upstairs. It wasn't an escalator, it was an old st- keep. And the lights went out and that was oh, terrifying. No. But it was more it wasn't like because it was scary being in the castle, it was just the lights went out and we couldn't see anything. That was the scary aspect, not ghosts. Mm. Would you not just sit down? Like with the escalators. Because if the power goes out, the escalator's gonna stop. Just sit down. Right, while we're here. Or just, you know, walk down the stairs. Yeah. Don't don't kick people down the stairs. No. No, but if there's you know, if they're there and they have a vaguely threatening aura, then you kick them down the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then okay. it's okay. 
So it's fine. <laughs> I don't know about you, Amanda, but the lesson I'm learning here is don't go up escalators with Cynthia if you're behind no. her. You go first. Yep. Yep. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be on an escalator with you at all, to be honest. Yeah, I would I would keep a good six feet away just to... That's just good practice anymore anyway. Yeah. Well, exactly. You're just doing your duty. Yeah. Anywho. (laughs) (laughs) Next question. Last question. Last question. As a matter of fact. Wow. Would you rather have your eyeball or your fingernails violently removed? (laughs) I hate both of these questions. I've got such a thing about fingernails. Oh, the oh, you know when in horror films when you see someone trying to get away and they pull them and the fingernails all oh they all break it's horrible i hate it however i feel the same about eyes you wrote it like, you have to choose not, know, it's your fault <laughs> <laughs> fingernails because they will grow back <laughs> your eyes not going to grow back and i don't know how good i'd look in a patch you could, you could be dazzling it could be beautiful oh yeah <laughs> It could just be my look. I could just it, be, yeah. Yes. And then yes. when you have no. small children, you just kind of peel it back and then there's just an empty oh, eyeball. It. Yeah. One-eyed Willy yeah. style. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Claire, didn't we recently talk about having glass eyes just a few episodes ago? Why does everything keep like doubling back on can itself? I do another, glass can eyes. I another, do another callback? Horror store fingernails. Yes. Remember, I haven't read it. Oh, I've not read it. Oh, but I love Grady Hendrix. Horror Store is a fingernail. Or you could oh. cheat and just listen to our episode where we discussed it. You could, or read our summary Great. online because that's also available. I think that one's up. I have an IKEA trip on the horizon, so I'll wait until after that's done. That's probably for the best. <laughs> it's too real. It's too real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Ooh. What about you, Amanda? Eyeball or fingernails? <laughs> I'm just I'm mm. I'm thinking about horror movies and fingernails now, and um, I think I think the worst one, or it's, it's one of my favorites, but um, it happens in Stir of Echoes, and it's really yes, yeah, that's a really good snapping. Ugh, well, I'm getting chills thinking yeah. about it, but that's a really good fingernail snap scene. And oh, that's a good film. Oh, it that's is. a really I good love film. It. Oh, it creeps me out so yeah. much. I love it. Um, but I think I think just for the same reason a couple episodes ago, I'm gonna go for the eyeball so I can have a glass eye and swap yeah. them out and make them exciting. <laughs> and take an, make it an accessory. Yeah. Yes, or be dazzling an eye patch. I wish I, I mean, could remember what we talked about. Glass it's eyes all in. beauty all the time. That was um, Bloodlines. That was Keith. Yes! Keith Keith getting his eyeball That's popped out. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. So what are you doing? Damn are, it. Are you, I just thought you were going to forget me. Are you violently removing your fingernails <laughs> or your eyeball? Ugh, ugh. I feel like the fingernail pin would last longer because you've got five. Well, yeah, but eyeball, it's just going to... You could have all ten. Yeah. And your toes. Oh. It will grow back, though, won't it? Oh, I just keep getting chills. Do you, do you know the other thing is I was thinking? <laughs> it's a horrible question. It's I'm busy doing one eye stuff because I'm both long and short sighted. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if I take one, how am I gonna get how am I gonna get glasses? I can't get contact lenses. My eyes are too dry. So I'm kinda like, what's gonna happen with the other one? Would it just be blacked out? Because that would be really boring. Well, you could have a clear lens. Oh, you could have a monocle. Yes! <gasps> I could monocle. go full steampunk yes. all the time. <laughs> that could be my aesthetic. Yes. Sold. Yes. Bye-bye eyeball. <laughs> I'm going steampunk all the time. 100%. Perfect. It's perfect. Cogs everywhere. Random mm-hmm. stuff. I want one of those teacup mm-hmm. attachments for my belt. Yes. And hip flask. Obviously. Obviously. 
Good. I'm glad that I'm glad we're both going like weird accessories with our missing eyeball. If you get, if you're gonna lose an appendage or something, you've got to go with the accessories. I mean, come on, you you've lost the stylish sunglasses realistically because they're, they're no use anymore. And plus, you can you know do interesting things with your hair with the fringes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Gabriella in the nineties. Yeah. She that was her whole aesthetic. One earth. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I never saw like underneath it. Was there anything underneath? Because the glass eye, there was a glass eye I underneath. Think there the was. Glass eye, or was there? Or was there a void in time and space? <laughs> Could she see Could into be. your soul and it was actually magic? Yes, she's one of the Google. fates. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's passing her remaining eyeball betwixt herself and her sisters. <laughs> what? Yikes, I don't know. That's the end. That's the end of Would You Rather. That's the end. What a perfect ending. Eyeballs. Eyeballs and fingernails. It's a great ending. I freaking love having guests on Would You Rather. I know, especially when it's horror. Oh, it's so good. Uh, uh. Everyone, be sure to go and check out the bonus episode. Yes. Because there's yes, more. Please. There's more great things. It's delightful. okay favorite final thought quote what do you have um i've only got two for you this week (gasps) me too Ooh. um there was loads there was quite a few but the ones that stood out to me because i thought well we've got a guest we may run a bit long we don't need the 11 quotes i usually pull the past few weeks yeah yeah so (laughs) to be fair I'm, i'm i wouldn't be surprised if you pulled this one and as soon as I heard it, I was like, yes. I immediately feel safe, cocooned. I love libraries. I love libraries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my second one is, because I, this this one felt real to me, given, you know, the spellings of my names. Weird spelling, in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> mm. What have you got? Okay. I do try to listen to him, but my inner self is too busy squealing with joy and mentally high-fiving strangers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love she's just so distracted by how like gorgeous Tommy is and she's not He's paying so dreamy. Not paying any attention to what's going on around her tripping and falling down, but <laughs> I lo- I just love that she's mentally high-fiving strangers. <laughs> Okay, my other one. Mm-hmm. Morbid and creepy are my jam. <gasps> that also feels like a callback as well. Yeah. What was our jam a few weeks Jenga. ago? Jenga. Jenga's our jam. Jenga is our jam. Jenga's our and jam. That, that was in the last girl slash the Mary Shelley Club. Yes. Oh my God, we did a callback. I know, I know. And that it's one perfect. speaks about you as well. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Love it. Oh my gosh. All right. If you liked this, try this. What okay, I'm going to give you a choice because I have two. Okay. You can choose either another British YA horror or would you like a Spring Hill Jack story? Let's go Spring Hill Jack. Okay. So, The Martian Ambassador by Alan K. Baker. Welcome to London. 1899. It has been six years since the discovery of intelligent life on Mars and relations between the two worlds are rapidly developing. Three-legged Martian omnibuses stride through the streets and across the landscape, while Queen Victoria has been returned to the vigour of youth by Martian rejuvenation drugs. Victorian computer technology is proceeding apace, (sighs) thanks to the fairies who power the cogitators, while the first ether zephyrs are nearing completion with a British expedition to the moon being planned for the following year. Everything seems to be going swimmingly, with Luan Rond, Martian ambassador to the court of St. James's. He dies attending a banquet at Buckingham Palace. The discovery of strange microscopic larvae in his breathing apparatus leads Queen Victoria to suspect that he may have been a victim of a bizarre assassination. The Martian parliament agrees, and they are not pleased. No Martian has ever died in such suspicious circumstances while on Earth. 
Dr. Maitland is given. If Her Majesty's government can't solve the crime and bring the perpetrator to justice, the Martians will. Enter Thomas Blackwood, Special Investigators for Her Majesty's Bureau of Clandestine Affairs, along with Lady Sophia Harrington, Secretary of the Society of Psychological Research. Blackwood is charged with the task of solving the mystery of the Ambassador Hans' death, while the Martians take matters in their own hands, possibly igniting an interplanetary war in the process. It is Victoriana, steampunk, sci-fi, spring Hill Jack. If you hadn't said spring Hill Jack, you wouldn't have gotten wouldn't it from know. that description. You wouldn't have, no, but... Yeah, he literally bounces around everywhere. Is it's it very because good. of is it because of gravity or because he has springs in his heels? Well, you know, it's kind of in his name. <laughs> oh, hmm. It's Does very good, fire? it's very atmospheric. Does he breathe fire? I can't remember. Just say yes. Just yes. say yes. Cool. Yeah. Yes. On it. Yes. If you like any Gail Carragher's as well, it's a different take on it. So yeah. it's interesting. It sounds like Gail Carragher in space. Yeah. Yeah, more of an adult twist to it as well. But yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. All right. What have you got? I just went with another horror that's also mystery that also is... Um, that con- it contains people who look like other people, which is, Ooh. you know, a nice tie into this one. Yeah. So this one's called I Killed Zoe Spanos by Kit Frick. What happened to Zoe won't stay buried. When Anna Sacconi arrives to the small Hamptons village of Heron Mills for a summer nanny gig, she has high hopes for a fresh start. What she finds instead is a community on edge after the disappearance of Zoe Spanos, a local girl who has been missing since New Year's Eve. Anna bears an eerie resemblance to Zoe, and her mere presence in town stirs up still raw feelings about the unsolved case. As Anna delves deeper into the mystery, stepping further and further into Zoe's life, she becomes increasingly convinced that she and Zoe are connected, and that she knows what happened to her. Two months later, Zoe's body is found in a nearby lake, and Anna is charged with manslaughter. But Anna's confession is riddled with holes, and Martina Green, teen host of the Missing Zoe podcast, isn't satisfied. Did Anna really kill Zoe? And if not, can Martina's podcast uncover the truth? Ooh, that would have been a good one. Been... Would have been a good one to recommend after Sadie, after we read Sadie, because that's the same thing. Podcast. Yeah, kind of a little bit Good Girl's Guide as well. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that one. Yeah. Oh, and the Maybe. next one's out. Oh, I need... Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, book three. <laughs> Again, I don't think it's out here. But that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything to you. You have contacts. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, do we have an indie spotlight this week? Oh, yes. This one we got a while ago in our email, you know, before we started doing indie spotlight. All right. And actually, I think maybe this person contacted us through our website which you can do by the way fictionalhangover.com you can scroll down to the bottom and contact us if you want to you can also send us emails fictionalhangover at gmail.com dm us on all the socials yeah at fictional hangover except for twitter at fictional hangover no er <laughs> so this one is while you're there go to redbubble <laughs> yes while you're there check out redbubble fictional hangover no er dot redbubble.com for all your favorite fictional hangover themed merchandise okay and also join us on Patreon. Okay, I'm gonna stop now. Um, this <laughs> one is ridiculous. <laughs> so this one is called Wraithwood, and it's by Alyssa Rote. An estranged uncle, a mysterious mansion, and Arthurian legend. Together, they lead to a world of magic and bloodthirsty wizards who want teenage Brinny dead. Brenna, Brinny Lane, has always lived a quiet life under the watchful eye of her hovering mother, until she sent off for the summer to live with an uncle she didn't know she had. 
While her parents get to travel across the globe, she'll be spending three months in the middle of nowhere, upstate New York. It looks like she might spend the entire summer friendless with her nose in a book. Hey, man, nothing wrong with your nose in a book. Sounds good. However, she soon finds that Wraithwood Estate, her uncle's creepy old mansion, holds as many secrets as the man himself. When Brinny is warned not to explore any of it, her curiosity only grows. As unnatural events take place and Brinny hears whispers of a hidden war, she must unravel the truth about her family's mysterious past if she wants to survive. Something terrible happened at Wraithwood 30 years ago, and Brinny is determined to find out what, even if it means confronting the possibility that magic is real. Ooh. Sounds like so much fun, right? Wraithwood, check that it does. out. That sounds really good. Yeah, yeah. So fun. All right, well, that's it for this episode of Fictional Hangover. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. Join us next time as we discuss The Golden Lily by Rochelle Mead. Ooh, more bloodlines! Yay! Look out for our Would You Rather polls on social media. Don't forget about our book club and monthly challenges on Facebook. Be sure to visit us. Uh, be sure to visit our shop on Redbubble at fictionalhangover.redbubble.com for all your favorite fictional hangover themed merchandise. I said it too many times earlier in the episode and now I'm getting tongue twisted. And become yeah. a patron of ours on Patreon at patreon.com slash fictional hangover. Until next time, remember, the only cure for a fictional hangover is another book. You can find us at fictionalhangover.com, follow us on Instagram at fictionalhangover, find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fictionalhangover, and on Twitter at fictionalhangover, no E-R. If you like this episode, check out our others, a rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss out. And finally, special thanks to Liz Emerson for our music. You can find her on Facebook and Patreon. Thanks for listening. I'm going to resume, and I'm going to do these clips, and then I'm going to pee in my pants.